All right, everyone, we will get started in two minutes. Welcome back. We'll get started in two minutes. Welcome back everyone. Our next session during the first annual encryption consulting virtual conference is titled Securing the Smart City, PKI and Data Encryption for IoT. And our speaker for this session is Adam Kaysen. Adam is Vice President of Global, Global and Strategic Alliances at FutureX, where he manages FutureX global relationships, including channel partners, OEM partners, strategic alliances, and technology partners. He has a strong technical background and deep knowledge of on-premise hardware security modules, cloud security services, key management, and enterprise class crypto crypto cryptographic ecosystems. Can you tell it's the afternoon? He started his career at FutureX as a solution architect, working closely with customers on product deployment, infrastructure analysis, and systems architecture. Please welcome Adam for his presentation. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining today. My name is Adam Kaysen. I'm Vice President of Global and Strategic Alliances for FutureX. And today we've got a real fun topic in store for everyone, and that is securing the smart city, PKI and data encryption for IoT. So, you know, I, I know as part of the overall encryption consulting conference here today and throughout the uh, the time period we're running this for, you're going to be seeing a lot of different things from a lot of different people. And one of the things when I was thinking about this topic to start with is that the Internet of Things, as it relates to the smart city in particular, really transcends so many different areas of data security these days, not only for us here as IT practitioners of various degrees, but also as consumers. And, you know, you look at the smart city to start. And I wanna give a little bit of an intro talking about what that is and hopefully frame up some of our, our discussion today around that. So when you hear smart city, what do you think? And, and when I talk to a lot of people about this topic, they often think, okay, municipal buildings, federal uh, uh, installations, things that relate solely around government. And that's not necessarily how I would view it here. And so when you look at the internet of things as it relates to the smart city, I would say that everything ranging from the car in your driveway to the airplane you take to go to meetings, to the infrastructure you use to pay for services, whether it's the parking meter or whether it's accessing um, you know, other elements of existing in a, a city, healthcare, communication, safety, security, you know, all these different interconnected things. I think that's really where something transitions from a collection of independent devices, each with their own needs, focuses, and technologies, to an overall ecosystem. And that ecosystem is what we're going to be talking about today, and in particular, how that can be secured. 
and what manufacturers of these devices need to take into, con into consideration, what the people who are deploying these devices need to take into consideration, and also what the end users should be aware of. So the three main areas of the smart city that we're gonna be talking about today, the edge, the network, the core. Um, the edge being the devices themselves, what you're actually holding in your pocket or what you're getting into to drive or, or uh, the things you actually interact with as a consumer or the things you deploy as a deployer of this technology. So that's the endpoint. Then we have the network. We've got the communication layer between the edge and the core that facilitates this communication. That has to be secure as well. And then finally, you get to the core. You get to the infrastructure that enables smart city functionality and IoT. And so for that, there are two aspects of it. Uh, one is manufacturing, and then the other is actual in the field production. And that's, that's important because quite often, for IoT in particular, you've got devices that are manufactured and then sent out into the field, never to return. You know, if you've got a smart light bulb or if you have a, a well, even a smartphone, the likelihood of you sending that back to the manufacturer for anything and getting that same device back in return, whether it's for a repair or reprovisioning or anything else like that, is slim. And so understanding that we're talking about both the manufacturing side and implementing security from the ground up, as well as the implementation side and the, the actual live, what happens when these devices are out there in the field side of things. Those are all part of what we would term the core. So building on that a little bit, talking about the importance of hardened cryptography. And, and by that, I, I mean FIPS 140-2 level three validated cryptography. And we'll talk a little bit more later about what that actually means from a practical standpoint. Um, but where, where are these deployed and why are they deployed there? And, and what trends are we seeing? So if you look at the history of these types of devices, data encryption and key management predominantly. Um, where were those deployed, right? Originally, historically, you'd see those very, very heavily used within government and financial services. And that makes sense. You know, you have to protect um, you know, government data, whether it's for defense or for employees or for, for citizens, and you have to protect the processes by which money moves around. So historically, those were the two main areas where this type of technology would come into play. But now, you know, especially over the last 10 to 15 years, we've really seen a dramatic uptick in the dispersion of this technology throughout other industries, you know, manufacturing, utilities, um, research and development, and you know, what we're talking about today fairly heavily, IoT devices. And so we're seeing this dramatic increase in the, the usage of this technology. Um, but along with that, we need to see that similar increase in security there. So when we look at the smart city, uh, what, what's actually driving this? You know, why are we seeing smart city data security becoming such a prominent topic for conversation these days? And I would say there are two main, two main drivers for that, um, or at least two main focal points on it. Now, one, one is just looking at the model by which this happens. And, and I would look at it in terms of a pull versus a push mentality and you know quite often you see people who say hey we need to establish this uh, global infrastructure for security and interconnected communication authentication of devices and trust between all these different components of the ecosystem that work together and they try to develop a solution for that and and you can have some very very smart people working on this with some very good ideas but the incentive necessarily to put that into place uh, is not always there. Or when you're dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of different uh, entities, separate organizations, trying to, to herd all the cats and get them all moving in the same direction, that can be challenging. And so that's the push method where, where you see people trying to create a new ecosystem that people want to be part of. Uh, then there's the pull approach where the end consumer or the end organizations are the ones driving this. And you've seen this a lot in the financial services industry where the establishment of payment interconnectivity and methods for linking up different services with a unified payments network have been really, really popular. And I think we've seen some great success stories over the last few years in that happening. That type of thing, personally, I think is how we're gonna see large scale interconnection between IoT devices out there as they make up what we term the smart city. 
Uh, and then secondly, the other main driver for it is next-gen communication. So pretty much everybody at this point is familiar with 5G technology. Uh, it's rolling out or has been rolled out in most major metropolitan areas, and we're seeing really fast ramp up of that as well. And so having this communication layer, being to have being able to have high bandwidth connections between all of these different devices out there, um, without that, you wouldn't be able to create a truly interconnected, interoperable smart city infrastructure. So beyond that, looking at how this is going to impact the end consumer, I think that that in particular will help impact that push method I talked about on the prior slide here. You know, how are you going to get the end users or the manufacturers of the devices that they they trust and use as part of their daily lives to adopt this? And you know, no no presentation would be a presentation without a few stats here. So I've got a few of them here just to look at. But I think looking at these trends and looking at how the growth of urban areas and the interconnectivity coming from cities is going to play a more and more important role in our societies over the coming years that's going to help help drive this but at the same time what's what else from a consumer standpoint is going to do it and to me seeing that stat up at the top there in the in the subtitle one that really honestly shocked me when i when i first read a study on that, you know, smart cities will give back 15 days to citizens each year. Like to me, that's impactful. That's something where there's a, a huge amount of interest in that when you phrase it like that. I know I, I would love to have 15 days to do whatever I want, um, but looking at it at from the standpoint of how it's actually deployed, that that's not 15 days saying, all right, my time begins now. I'll, I'll see you in two weeks. It's incremental. You know, you look at, for example what a normal day looks like for an average person. Um, you know, uh, work from home notwithstanding, let's, let's assume that I get up in the morning and I go get in my car and I commute into the city. That commute might take 20 or 30 minutes where my focus is on driving, on making sure I get there safely and all that. I go park or I get ready to park. Well, parking meter is full or the garage is full. I have to find another one. Then I go into the building and I need to, to get my access card out to access it, go up to my office where I log in, log into the network, access what I need to do to start my, my day. Um, beyond that, I go out and I get lunch. You know, I'm, I'm weaving a scenario here that's all too common where each of those items, each of those steps involves time. You know, whether it's uh, taking out your card to pay for parking or going to a kiosk or uh, driving your own car, you know, all of these things we'll see incremental gains in time savings through the deployment of the smart cities. You know, if I have my self-driving autonomous car take me to work, well, that's that's 25 minutes a day of extra time that I can use for whatever, you know, talking with friends or catching up on email or reading the newspaper or anything like that. That's how that 15-day time frame comes, uh, comes into play. That's where that comes from. And I, I think organizations seeing that and promoting those types of concepts is going to be really important to the growth in the smart cities. But we're talking so far about the convenience aspects of it. We're talking about the drivers that are going to cause largely consumers to want the organizations that they work with and the device manufacturers that they, um, they purchase uh, devices from to adopt this. Now, what, what directions would it come from from the device manufacturer's standpoint? And that's security. So what, what risks are out there that smart cities face? So we're seeing today, and over the last really five to 10 years in particular, we're seeing a very interesting shift in the type of cyber threats that are out there. Um, things are increasing in complexity, things are increasing in prevalence, and it's not just independent hackers who are, who are uh, seeking out security vulnerabilities and exploiting them. Now you're starting to see nation state based attacks. You're seeing hacktivism, you're seeing organized crime and things that are happening on a, a global scale. And, and we've all seen a variety of different uh, news stories over the last few years that relate to this. You know, but one of the areas I think that's particularly ignored, I think it could have a lot more attention paid to it, would be that last one at the bottom of my, my graphic here, right by point B, and it's the unintentional risk factors. And that's something where you get organizations who don't know what they don't know, and it becomes difficult there to, to have a robust security program from that standpoint. 
And so working to counteract that, I think, is very important for all of us here as security practitioners. So let's talk about some specific elements of smart city risks. And there are three main categories that we've seen so far. And the first would be privacy, data, and identity theft. And, and that's something very common to a lot of different industries right now. That's not anything new necessarily. Um, and there are mitigation and security measures that help prevent that. You know, authentication, encryption, access control, everything like that. Um, the second is something that is a little bit new for the smart city. Although we've seen this, uh, we've seen device hijacking come into play in a lot of different industries for a while now. You've got very small, lightweight devices that are in people's houses. Think thermostats, doorbells, cameras, cable boxes, everything like that, that have a lot more computing power than they did previously. You, know, you hear news stories about, um, you know, groups finding zero day vulnerabilities and loading cryptocurrency mining software onto things, things that just sit in the background and leech off of resources, things like that. And that's that's not even as nefarious as it, as it can get. And then finally, we've got DDoS, PDoS, and man in the middle attacks. And, and so everybody probably at this point, for the people who are here today, they're familiar with the first and the last one there. But one that I, I found some interesting things about was PDOS, and that's permanent denial of service. That's the idea that a hacker or, or a malicious actor could get into an infrastructure and actually permanently disable devices, um, you know, through manipulating power sent to them and, and other things that are, that are accessible over a network. And so in this scenario, I mean, imagine if someone finds a zero day vulnerability in a connected vehicle and they find some way to remotely and permanently disable those. And all of a sudden you've got hundreds of thousands of people who can't get to work in the morning, right? You've got a lot of really dangerous scenarios here that need strong security to guard against that. So all of these risks need to be reduced. And how is that done in a way that's interoperable? Well. For what we're talking about today, regardless of whether you're looking at um, you know, IoT for consumers or industrial IoT um, or distributed systems across a, a wide, wide ranging geographic area, they need to be scalable, they need to be compliant. And some of those compliance standards are emerging right now. And we'll talk about some of those later. They need to be interoperable and then they need to be crypto agile. And by crypto agile, what I mean is that they need to be ready for the next generation of technology. You know, everybody here today is probably hearing uh, information about post-quantum cryptography and, and the changes that are going to bring to the industry. And that's absolutely correct. It will bring some very big changes to the industry. And developers of cryptographic products, um, HSMs or hardware security modules, key management servers, everything like that, they need to be prepared for that. But at the same time, it's also important to know that this is not the last time we will see an algorithm shift in our lifetimes here. You know, just being involved myself pretty heavily in the financial payments industry, I, I remember the transitions from, from DES to triple DES, and now what we're seeing is the transition from triple DES to AES. And, and so looking at that, saying, all right, I can, I can detect a pattern here. This is not the last time we're going to see this type of transition. That's something important to remember for device manufacturers, especially for ones that have long lifespans that are going to be out there in the field for you know, decades, even in some cases. So I mentioned a little bit a minute ago about HSMs or hardware security modules. And let's talk about that from a foundational perspective. So what are HSMs or hardware security modules? Um, well, these are purpose-built tamper evident and tamper responsive devices that are designed to securely store keys and to perform cryptographic processing operations. So when you're dealing with IoT, PKI, or public key infrastructure, you need strong HSM-backed cryptography at the foundation of that. Now, I talk, I, I talk compliant. What do I mean by compliant? Well, typically for the Internet of Things and for PKI, deployers of that look for a certain level of hardware-backed security through HSMs that meet a number of different standards. You can see a few examples of them here. Um, but compliance, quite often you look for FIPS or FIPS 140-2 level three, which is transitioning now to FIPS 140-3 level three as the fairly well-established standard that you want to meet as, as kind of a bare minimum for HSM-backed security for these types of devices. So when you hear about hardware security modules, uh, know that those are typically at the core of any enterprise PKI. 
But it's not only the pure cryptography and the key management that's part of it. It's also the applications that are around, are around that, the interface methods, the APIs that are designed for manufacturers of IoT devices to connect to them and actually utilize those services. So let's talk now a little bit about how that root of trust through PKI is established. And so I wanna use an example. I wanna talk about connected vehicles here because it's fun to talk about. It's something that we're seeing a lot of nowadays. And it's something that I think fits into this, this concept of the smart cities very, very well. You know, it's not just about the individual having access to their self-driving car to, you know, let them, let them you know, play iPhone games while, they're, while the car is driving to work. It's about uh, reducing traffic accidents. It's about reducing the need for such heavy infrastructure on the highways by having coordinated movement of multiple vehicles at once. There, there are a lot of benefits to it outside of this. And so manufacturers of these devices are thinking now about how they deploy this. So you start on the manufacturing floor and you have uh, components that are being made. So let's say engine control units uh, in, this, in this example right here. So all of those devices, all of those ECUs have to be digitally signed at the point of manufacturing. So they are authenticated. They say, I'm a brand X car, I am trusted. I've been digitally signed from the point of manufacturing. So you establish that route of trust right there on the manufacturing floor. And you use cryptographic infrastructure in incorporating hardware security modules, PKI applications, and this technology to do that. And so when you build that in straight away on the manufacturing floor, you establish that foundational trust, you know that those components are always going to be authenticated. You're able to confirm, yes, this is a brand X car. Uh, yes, the firmware up updates we push down to it are secure, things like that. Now, for some devices, um, you know, especially small, lightweight ones or, or uh, ones that are fairly often replaced, uh, phones, for example, signing the actual devices themselves, whether that's a, a TPM um, inside the device or some sort of secure element, that's fine in a lot of cases. Uh, there are other situations like with larger devices that typically are, are higher cost, they have longer lifespans, you know, think cars, think satellites, things like that. If they're going to be out there in the field for a long time and need a higher level of assurance. Some of those actually need cryptographic modules embedded inside them. So that's another possibility there. So now we look at how they're deployed out there in the field. So once these devices are out there, you know, these, these uh, you know, miniature HSMs are embedded in the, the vehicles or, or those devices are signed, um, what can you do with that as a manufacturer? So you establish trust, but why would you want to establish trust? Well, you can do that for gathering information from your deployed devices. So in this example, vehicle health or environmental conditions or um, where your individual vehicles are at any point in time. So for example, if you're an automobile manufacturer and you want to explore the idea of having rental cars, well, being able to track those and be certain cryptographically where they're at, that they have an authenticated driver in them, that they're accepting their payment methods securely and that that's confirmed, that's, that's important. You know, you really couldn't offer that type of service without this fundamental technology. You can also push things down to those vehicles or to those satellites or to those devices, whether it's key rotation for the cryptographic keys on it, uh, whether it's pushing content down to it, firmware updates, licenses, you know, example, maybe you wanna have in your vehicles a standardized battery pack where every, every vehicle gets um, you know, a baseline level of range through that battery. But maybe for some performance models, you wanna unlock additional capacity. We can do that through PKI, through this type of infrastructure. So what, we're, what we talked about here, that's, that's all well and good. That's focused on, on new devices, but how are you gonna handle that for existing devices that are already in the field? Because it's not that easy. You, know, you can't just go and pick up a, a device. I, I can't take my, my phone here and say, hey, I, I need it to be digitally signed. Um, how do you, because you can't establish that trust you can't ever be certain that I'm actually me unless it's being done at the manufacturing floor there. And so for manufacturers now who are considering this in the future, there are a few things they need to think about. So are the current components scalable? How are you going to handle interoperability with legacy systems? How are you going to enable new functionality? And then for devices that break or need to be repaired or upgraded, how are you going to handle that? 
and that's that's a really important consideration that uh, that can only be done really from the get-go. And I want to give an example actually about how this has been done really really well. Uh, so so I live in San Antonio here, and and our electric company uh, came by. They put a notice on my house one day. Said, hey, by the way, uh, we will be installing a new smart meter at your house for all these different benefits later this week. And I looked at that. And Okay, great. So um, I'm kind of getting these mental mental images of my my wife's garden getting torn up and and you know being without power for a day and all these things. And then I came home one day and they put another little label on my door that said, "Hey, we're done." And I go out and I look at the meter on the side of my house. No, nothing's torn up in my lawn. Nothing really different. The only thing that was different was this one module in the electrical meter itself. And I looked at. It. And I said, this is, this is intelligent. This is a, a really good architectural decision that someone, you know, when they built this house back in the 90s or early 2000s, um, when the power company was putting that in, they said, you know, we're looking in the future. We may have a need to transition this. So they made it possible to just pop out the old meter and pop in the new one right there. And I thought that was a really good way of doing this. This was something that enabled them to have all of the benefits of smart metering without having a huge cost or infrastructural burden. You know, they could get my whole neighborhood in a day, probably. So this was a good example, I think, of how that could, uh, you know, how that can work out and how it should be done. Now, another another real world example relates to big data and how all of these different elements that make up a smart city connect together. And I, I want to talk about rats here. And and I always like this example because it's kind of a fun one. But um, Chicago, some years back, they had a, a rat problem, and so they also had a smart city effort underway where they were collecting data from dozens and dozens of different sources throughout their city, and they were aggregating those in a single uh, tool or a single interface where the city planners and the people organizing things were able to pull from all of these different data sources to analyze trends and take action based on it. So with the rats, uh, Chicago pulled data from all of these different sources, 31 of them, in fact, you know, garbage cans, you know, whether or not there was a, a sanitation strike, weather patterns, things like that. And they were able to solve or at least predict uh, you know, rat locations about a week before residents would even report them in all likelihood and take action based on that, all due to this smart city infrastructure. Um, and, and knowing that that is secure is critical for that. You know, if you can't trust your data that all of these endpoints and sources collect, then this data is worthless. And so looking at the interoperability side of things and looking how all of these devices are tied together, um, a lot more comes into play with the true uh, you know, a holistic smart city right here. And I think this is a fun example to talk about there. Now, as we start to, to wind down here, I wanted to talk about the future and what we're seeing with that. And there's one area in particular that I think is fun and it's called lightweight cryptography. And so some of you may be familiar with it already, um, but the whole concept behind lightweight cryptography is that the IoT is full of little devices. And I don't mean physically little necessarily, but devices that don't have a huge amount of battery or computing resources. You know, think like a, a light bulb, for example, or, or anything like that. Well, those things still should be part of an overall smart city infrastructure, but they don't have the resources to handle very heavy uh, encryption and key management tasks. And NIST has acknowledged this, and they're actually running an effort, a uh, contest, if you will, right now, similar to what they're doing for post-quantum cryptography, where they're seeking algorithms that are designed to be fast, lightweight, and designed for these types of devices. So that, um, that effort to seek out these algorithms, submit them for peer and community review, and then finalize on standard is well underway right now. And you know, one of the things over the last year and a half or so that, that I think is very telling about both this effort within NIST as well as the post-quantum cryptography effort is that even with uh, COVID, even with a lot of work from home and a lot of uncertainty there, these two efforts have remained largely on track, if not sped up. And that's not what, what I would have expected necessarily. And seeing this and seeing that amount of dedication to it, I think speaks to the overall level of importance this topic has for us as an industry. And so this is one where we're going to be seeing a lot of interesting 
detail come out about this. Um, but I would encourage you if you're interested in this, NIST has a good website that goes into lightweight cryptography, why it's used, some of the foundational technology, as well as the algorithms that are candidates right now as well. So looking towards the future, that's going to play an even more important role. And then finally, I want to leave with, with this. Um, the biggest challenge that, that I feel smart cities have and the IoT device manufacturers and the implementers of this technology, whether they're implementers of the devices themselves or the people who are helping to craft the PKI environments that, that are foundational to this, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we face here is interoperability. And that's got to be a priority, you know, like like that example in Chicago, I, I talked about a few minutes ago, that wouldn't be possible unless you had a strong level of interoperability. And so I, I leave I leave you with that. Not any any hugely technical takeaway as far as final say, but more a broad focus on interoperability. I think it's incredibly important. And so with that, I'll say thank you all for joining us here. You know, if you have any questions or want to follow up on this, please don't hesitate to reach out to the organizers uh, of this. They'll be able to get with us to help get any questions or answers over to you. This is a very exciting topic to us right now and, and something we're really looking forward to continuing to share with the industry together. So thank you again for your time today. It's, it's always a pleasure and have a good rest of your day. Excellent. Thank you, Adam, for that presentation. Thank you for joining me live. Welcome, welcome. I have a couple of questions for you. Let's start with one from the audience. Uh, do you predict lightweight cryptography to run without HSMs? Perfect. That's a, that's a really good question. And so I think when you look at the implementation of lightweight cryptography, I mean, it's, it's designed kind of in principle for things like light bulbs or, or things that are almost disposable. Well, in fact, are disposable in a lot of senses. And so I think looking at implementing something like an HSM or some sort of functional equivalent to it within those wouldn't be in the realm of, of likelihood. But, you know, when you look at some of the foundational aspects, you know, how are the keys that are used um, at the root of that stored and managed? I think you're still going to see some of those same technology foundations that have been used throughout uh, the IoT uh, for, well, since the dawn of time, really, with that. So I would say a little bit of a hybrid approach to that in all likelihood. Makes sense. Um, this is a specific question. How can IoT benefit the healthcare industry? How can IoT benefit the healthcare industry? Um, so when you look at the, the types of activity that's going on in healthcare right now, it's just moving so quickly, even, even as an industry that just like financial services, when you think about it, it tends to move almost at a, at a glacial pace with, with good reason too, you know, whether you're dealing with things that impact people's health um, or dealing with moving around money or anything like that, you want to really be sure you know what you're doing before you do it. But one of the things we're seeing these days is a dramatic increase in the number of connected devices that are involved in the healthcare field. Um, you know, whether it's something pretty obvious like, um, yeah, well, there's the, the intuitive surgical robots that actually do robot assisted surgery. I mean, of course, you're, you're going to need a, a very strong level of security for that. You're going to need to have things like code signing, which I know some sessions earlier today have, have spoken to. I mean, all of, the, all of those things are kind of fundamental. But, you know, there are a lot of things that don't jump out at you intuitively, which I think was kind of interesting, like hospital beds, for example. I mean, I, I didn't know this personally until I was actually talking with someone in the industry, but they actually have firmware that runs on them that needs to be signed. Uh, some of them even have certain features you can enable and disable based on where they're deployed, certain things that are required. Some of those same feature enablement type activities that we spoke about during the session apply to those. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, at least in the U.S. here, we're seeing a lot of motion within the FDA in their regulation of medical devices and putting in standards that deal with the security of it as well. And so it, it's very much a, an active field right now. And it's been fun seeing that grow and continue to evolve. Yeah, it makes sense. There's a lot of changes happening and, and I'm sure uh, a light, light next speed as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, how does encryption help improve security for IoT devices? 
Yeah, so you're dealing a lot with data. Oh, well, you're dealing with a lot of data that's captured at that endpoint. So if I'm using um, my phone, or, or let's say I have a thermostat that's Alexa enabled, and so it's capturing uh, voice data or anything else like that, you want to make sure that that information, if it's being transmitted to some remote location, a central server for analysis and processing, you want to make sure that's encrypted on the way there. You need to have that there, um, all very traditional uses of it. You wanna make sure that for firmware updates or feature enablement or anything that's pushed down to that device, that needs to be encrypted, secured, most importantly, digitally signed. That way no one can load um, you know, a hacked firmware on your thermostat, your car, your cable box. Um, you also look at it from the manufacturer's perspective as well, not just from the end consumer's perspective. Um, you know, think back to the kind of 1980s where you had people climbing telephone poles so they could go get free HBO. Well, that same equivalent, uh, people still attempt to do that today, only it's a little bit different. It's a little more uh, electronically um, nuanced and complex with that. And so for the manufacturers of cable TV boxes, they still need to be able to control what content is available to their subscribers. And so that can be done for both protection of that information and that IP, as well as monetization of it. That makes sense. Um, and here's just sort of a, a good question to close on, and, and, and part of your presentation did touch on this, of course, but what are the challenges of securing, securing IoT devices? So the challenges of securing IoT devices, um, you know, first you have to determine what's the lifespan of this device going to be. Um, if it's something like a, you know, a, a phone, right? A phone, as much as I'd like to say this weren't the case, a, a phone is basically disposable. I mean, most people, uh, for the most part, um, they're going to refresh their phone every few years. Let's say under five years, right? Um, I, I know for me, unfortunately, it's a lot faster than that um, sometimes. But, you know, you look at that and you look at the level of, of security implemented there. And then you look at the opposite end of the spectrum with long lifespan devices, things like satellites, where you're going to put that up in orbit and it's going to be there for 40 years. Well, you know, I've heard earlier today in some of the other sessions, people talking about post-quantum cryptography. And that's a great example of the applications of it. You know, you need to be able to sign your firmware running on those satellites using uh, accepted cryptography nowadays that's useful today, but you also need to plan for the future. So how do you dual sign devices like that so that you know, 35 years from now, you're not having to try to send an astronaut up to re-sign your, your satellite or something like that? So you've got some challenges there and things where determining how you begin and how you look at that is important, but also looking at decisions of how you as an organization or how your organization is going to take advantage of some of the, the new features enabled by this foundational security. You know, it's not just necessarily about protecting uh, firmware updates. It's not just about protecting the information that's gathered by those devices, whether it's you know, PII for the end user or whether it's sensor data or anything else like that. It's also, I think, about looking at how you can transition it from being a cost center to a value add or something that could even be monetized and looking at different opportunities like that, whether it's um, figuring out a way for families to be able to electronically rent a movie for their kids while they're on a road trip in the car and be able to transact that payment without ever pulling out their credit card or, or stopping to pull over or anything like that. I mean, there are opportunities out there that really take this from being just a pure headache type challenge that, yeah, we know we need to implement this because there are bad people out there trying to take advantage of things to how can we offer our end users greater value, more services, and ultimately makes, make their lives better. Yeah. Um, and then maybe just a personal question for you to, to close it up. Is there any particular innovation uh, within smart cities that you are excited to see uh, in the near future? You know, I, I know this is a really hot, uh, it's a really hot button issue and a lot of people have different opinions, but if someone told me, hey, you could get in your automated car and not have to ever touch the steering wheel again, um, and, and I could do whatever on it, like I would absolutely drop everything. I would, I would pay whatever it took to do that. I mean, the amount of time that we could save as a, a society by, by doing that is just unreal. And so for me personally, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. 
would I miss driving here and there? Yeah, I guess so. But, but you know what, having an extra couple hours a day of, of time to do what I want, that, that kind of makes up for that pretty quick. Yeah, I'm with you there as a I, I'm Canadian and, and driving through the prairies. If I could uh, be napping or working during the 12 hour journey across the flat plains, I sure, <laughs> sure would try and make that happen. Uh, I know, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've, I've got a, a couple of bets going as to whether or not my kids who are about six years old right now are going to end up getting driver's licenses or not. I'm, I'm leaning towards probably not, not out of any desire, but just out of the way society is going to work in another 10 years from now. And our cars will be antiques. There we Never go, mind right? driving stick shift. No, you'll have to pay a fortune we'll for insurance on, uh, on, a, on a human driven car. Yeah, exactly. Well, Adam, thank you so much uh, for your insights today. We really appreciate you joining us live and your presentation. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And thank you to the whole encryption consulting team for putting on a fantastic event here. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great day, Adam. We'll, we'll see you soon. All right. Talk to you all soon. Thanks, everyone. And these presentations, like we've mentioned, will be recorded and we will send you a link once they become available. And uh, we will start our next session here very shortly and we'll see you there. Thank you.